Good morning or good afternoon. I'd like to welcome everyone to our session today titled Cisco Wireless Clean Air Technology, 3500 APS. We're glad to have you with us. A few housekeeping notes to begin. As you entered the WebEx console, you either joined us by audio broadcast or by phone, which was automatically muted. Because of our large audience in attendance today, you will remain muted throughout the event. When you have a question, please feel free to enter into the WebEx Q&A panel as you think of them. You can find the Q&A panel on the right-hand side of the console. Please leave the WebEx chat window for communication to our WebEx facilitators for any technical problems or issues you may be experiencing. This session is being recorded and you will be sent an email after the session with the recording. We would appreciate your input regarding today's webcast. A short survey will appear when you close your browser at the end of the event. At this time, I'd like to introduce our host, Francine Richards. Francine, I'll turn the program over to you. Thank you. Um, hello and welcome to the Cisco Support Community. Today we are presenting a live Cisco Support Community Expert Series webcast event. During our event today, our topic will be Cisco Wireless Clean Air Technology 3500 APs. My name is Francine Richards and I am the project manager for the Cisco Support Community here at Cisco. Our expert joining me today is going to be Nicola Darshi, a wireless and network management expert. He is a senior customer support engineer and CCIE in wireless. Welcome, Nicola. Hello. And now I'd like to briefly outline the format for today's expert series event. Nicola will start with a short presentation on Cisco Wireless Clean Air Technology for the first 25 minutes of the program. And then we will dive into the live question submissions for the remainder of today's event. During our live presentation, you may submit a question to be answered by Nicola and a team of Cisco technical experts using the Q&A box located on the right side of your console. The team of technical experts is well-versed in Cisco clean air technologies, so please begin posting your questions now to give us the best chance of answering them during the broadcast. If you experience any technical issues, please post your questions in the chat. We'll be asking polling questions during this webcast, and we encourage you to participate by answering them. You may also download a copy of today's PDF presentation using the link in the chat window. Now let's get started with today's event. I'd like to start off with the polling question for the audience. What is your opinion about Cisco Clean Air Solution? A, I'm clear on what it is and I think it rocks. B, I heard about it. It looks cool and I wanna learn more about it. C, I'm wondering how different it is from the competitor solutions. D, I have no idea what it is and E, I still think it doesn't fit my needs. Please take a moment to answer this as it will give Nicola an opportunity to tailor his presentation today to meet your needs. Make sure to submit your questions as we will answer them later in the webcast. And now I would like to hand the mic to Nicola who will give you an expert look into Cisco Clean Air Technologies. Hello everyone. Uh, first, let me apologize if you hear some strange noises or coughing. That's because I got a little bit sick this weekend, but hopefully I should be fine. So today's agenda, uh, we'll start with a bit of theory, uh, very light, just explaining what is clean air. Uh, then we'll see how to enable clean air, how to troubleshoot common issues, and uh, hopefully I will show a small lab example. At the end of the session, you'll be um, able to ask the questions and I, I will answer as, as much as possible. So first thing, what is clean air and what is the problem it is actually solving? Um, it's been a long time that wireless is around and originally when it was 802.11b, it was just a convenience uh, network. It was just a hotspot, it's there, you can use it, you know, it, it's handy. If it doesn't work, don't complain, just, just take a cable and, and that's it. But more and more, and especially with the last standards and, and the higher speeds, like when people hear 300 megabits, People want to do the same on wireless as they are doing on the wire. They want to run video, they want to go for multicast, and they expect it to work just the same. They, they don't realize it's still the same medium. Even if we bring new standards, new modulation techniques, it's still the same air as 20 years ago, and it still has the same problems. 
first of all, is that it's it's the shared medium, so everyone is using the same air. So you just cannot invent bandwidth because it's, everyone is, is just shouting wireless packets around. So that's the issue. So far, all the access points were building technologies in layer two, layer three, layer four, but still layer one was the air, and you could not do much about it. If you have interference, it's interference. Just just live with it. What is the, having the cleaner access point that other APs uh, don't have? Actually, it's an extra chipset. It's a, a spectrum analyzer chipset. For those who know the product, uh, it's the, the Cisco Spectrum Expert that was brought inside the access point and even uh, even more improved. So what it exactly does is analyze interference. That's it. Why is it better than just what people were doing before? Because if you just look at marketing uh, advertisements and slides, people analyze interference since uh, ages. So you wonder what's new? Well, it's a dedicated chipset. So it's uh, it's at, at the same speed of the, um, it's happening in line. I mean, so you have your wireless clients on one side on the Wi-Fi chipset, and at the same time, you have the uh, interference analysis with the dedicated hardware uh, side by side. So there's no processing overhead on the access point. It's happening uh, completely real time. Because it's a dedicated chipset, it's 15 times more granular. And because you have a picture that is 15 times clearer, you can actually take more intelligent actions. The actions are the same as before. There's still no magic laser uh, cleaning stuff, but at least the actions you take now can make sense because you exactly know what is around. And thanks to the whole architecture, what we can do is also locate on the map those interference and correlate them between uh, several locations and, and controllers. Here is an example. On the left, you have an example of uh, one of the, the, the best competitor from Cisco. And actually, it was the same for Cisco APs until Clean Air. Uh, it's, it's what the access point sees from a, a noise perspective. So you can see the uh, bottom down scale is is five megahertz range. So the, the smallest resolution you have is five megahertz. So here you have a, an area where you have some red, you know, it, you know it's busy, but what is it? Is it Bluetooth? Is it microwave oven? How can you know? You, you just cannot. What the AP will say is that I report 20% interference, but that just doesn't mean anything. So, and on the right, you have clean air. The chipset that is actually uh, dedicated and, and unique has a resolution of 150 kilohertz. And thanks to that, it can detect pretty much anything. Like Bluetooth, for example, is only one megahertz wide. Uh, that's 20 times smaller than, than Wi-Fi. So thanks to that, the, the cleaner chips can differentiate that actually there was a microwave oven and the Bluetooth happening in parallel in, in the same region. And it identifies it uh, immediately as well. It can uh, recognize multiple devices at once. There is no hard limit. Uh, the more devices there are, the harder it is to, to identify them. But after test, we've seen dozens and dozens of devices. So you can have everyone with a Bluetooth phone around and a microwave, and still the chipset will find them all. So if, if you manage to push the chipset to the limits, that means you have other worries uh, in your network, like 100 people with Bluetooth phones in the same location. So. What does this allow us to do? Because now we have a clearer picture, okay. We still have the same uh, system behind, the RRM, uh, Radio Resource Management, but now we can take smarter actions. Like before, there is interference. Oh, you move to another channel. Well, really, was it needed? If it's a microwave oven, you maybe want to move to another channel because that is just killing you. If it's a Bluetooth and just one Bluetooth device, you can probably live uh, at the same time. You will just have a few packet loss, but probably it's, it's acceptable. So then changing channel is not the best action to take. But then the decisions can be, uh, can, can be a bit different. If you have several Bluetooth phone, a decked phone, uh, you have uh, the microwave oven at the same time, you have an analog radio transmitter, because now you can know exactly what devices are around. You can know if it's worth or not to change the channel. So this makes much smarter decision. Uh, this is a kind of diagram that is not so clear. <laughs> uh, you have to look at it from bottom up. So you have the clean air access point, 
and the chipset on it. It's the Sage uh, chipset. It actually detects and identifies the interference itself in real time, so it doesn't need to talk to anyone to do it. So the access point directly knows, okay, this is Bluetooth, this is microwave in real time. So the AP only has to send to the controller reports about this. So it's actually not a big overload from a network perspective. And that's really one good point as well. The controller also doesn't have much computing power uh, required. So the fact that you have 500 access points is, is not really a concern. Uh, the controller is having all the reports from all the access points. What the controller can do is to merge those reports because if you have one device, more likely you will have more than one APs reporting it. All the APs around that interference will report it. And the controller is smart enough to actually notice the similarities in the signature and, and to merge them as, as one device. From there, uh, you, you have already nice information, but what can you have more if you have look, uh, MSC, the, the Mobility Service Engine Appliance, and the WCS is that you have a graphical representation. You have the historical database, so you can know, okay, uh, one week ago, what interferers were present uh, on, on, on the Friday afternoon. And this allows you to notice that maybe every Friday afternoon there is the same interferer turned off turned on at the same location. So then maybe you think it's time to go on a Friday afternoon at that location and, and find out who is doing that. Um, so you have the whole user experience that is totally changed because you, you have it located on the map. Uh, you have it m actually even merged between controllers because we saw the controller was merging from different access points. But what if different controllers report the same interferer? controllers don't talk to each other to, to see if they have to merge it or not. It's the MSC appliance doing that. So uh, we already saw this a bit. Uh, what was different before? Before the Wi-Fi chipset was seeing, okay, this is signal I can demodulate. It's a Wi-Fi signal. It, it's, I know the modulation, it's just Wi-Fi. The rest, oh, I cannot decode it, it's not Wi-Fi. It could be a microwave oven, it could be Bluetooth, it could be actually Wi-Fi, but that is not really on the same channel like overlapping channel. It could be uh, Wi-Fi, but there was a collision, so the, the end of the packet is missing or, or whatever. Uh, it could be a corruption of, of the packet because of, of metal reflection. It could be anything. So you just had a noise level that was best guessed percentage, and you could just not know if it was because you had high load or if you had one interfering devices. So now we can differentiate energy that cannot be demodulated. These are the two reports that Cleaner uh, can actually do. So we saw the Cleaner chipset can identify the, the devices, but then it has to report information to the controller. Let's start actually with the second one, which is more intuitive, interference device report. This is just a report saying, hey, I found one Bluetooth device. Uh, it's doing a discovery. It, it's scanning for neighbors. Uh, it has this signal strength, and it has uh, this uh, um, duty cycle, It has and give all the information about it. Air quality index is actually a kind of percentage, how good is the air? So the AP will report, the air is 89% uh, good where, where I am. Where does this 89 come from? Actually, now it's not just the best guess. It can calculate the severity of the devices. So if it's just Bluetooth devices uh, doing a discovery for, for neighbors, it's not very severe, or, or just Bluetooth device being present and just passively scanning, then they will have a severity of, of two or three, let's say. But if uh, somebody is doing a file transfer on Bluetooth and, and just really uh, going really loud on the Bluetooth, then maybe this will have a 10 severity. So air quality having 89% means that you have 11% of, of interference meaning maybe you will see the, the, the breakdown, you will have 5% because you have a microwave oven and 6% because you have this. So you can really know exactly uh, what is the air quality. Uh, this is also uh, some nice information to know. So the chipset on the AP is working real time, but um, has to wait a bit to, to return the, the values. So you need uh, 15 seconds to have the values updated, but the average, because we saw that the air quality percentage is an average, 89%, actually it's taken in the last 15 minutes. 
So the access point said, in the last 15 minutes, I can average the air quality to 89%. You can put it in rapid mode in 30 seconds, but do you really want to do that? Because 30 seconds is really, I mean, it's really short. You would have the AP saying, oh, the air is really bad. It's 50% now. And then 30 seconds later, oh, it's okay. It's 100%. And then 30 seconds later, oh, it's really bad again. Okay, it's just an intermittent device interfering, but you may you know, want to have a stable average, not just random numbers thrown out. So uh, I talked about this uh, a bit already. So the air quality is a percentage. You have the worst uh, air quality during the, the averaging period and the average. And you know exactly which devices uh, contributed to that, to that number. So you know the severities of, of all the interferences. 100 is the best air and zero is, is the worst air you can have. Uh, the RRM feature selecting channels uh, and, and transmit power is actually using this information. So that's, that's really nice. Um, the difference is that you can have an interference that is at really low signal strength. It will not be really considered seriously. And an interference at the more uh, higher duty cycle, for example, Will be will be taken much more seriously. Uh, this is the interferer device report. So we can see it's the the list of the first top ten uh, devices identified. And usually, if you have ten devices, that means the air is already seriously polluted. So it's it's a matter of traffic sent to the controller. We, we could have sent more devices reports, but uh, then you, the, the controls just overload it. So knowing about the ten worst in each area is is already kind of a really good compromise. It, it's rare to have at least actually 10 devices interfering to one access point. How does the merging happen? Because we said that the controller is able to identify that two APs are seeing the same device, interfering device, or if it's another one. Well, actually, the controller analyzes the signatures, and the signatures are assigned a pseudo MAC address. It's obviously not a MAC address because you will see that a microwave oven will be assigned a MAC address by the controller, which is not making sense. But it's just a kind of signature. It's one way to use a hash signature. And two interference that will ref reflect the same device will actually have a pseudo MAC that is very close to each other. Maybe not the same because, you know, there can be obstacles, there can be a bit of variations. Uh, but if two APs are seeing a device, and both those devices have a signature that is really, really close, very good chance that uh, this device is actually the same interfering device. And the controller can also know because uh, the APs can, can hear each other if they're close. If the APs hear each other, it's another chance that actually those interfering devices are the same. So then the merging will happen. If the APs don't hear each other at all, and the controller knows that because of this, they're really far away from each other, it's very unlikely that they actually are seeing the same uh, interfering device. So that's one more intelligence in, in the process. Uh, yeah, this is, this is what I mentioned. So the controller will do that for APs physically connected to it. And because it knows the, it's the uh, RF neighbor messages, so APs say, sending RF messages to each other, it knows which AP is close to which one. So it can it can decide if it's likely or not that they're seeing the same uh, interfering device. Nothing else is happening on the controller. So controller is just storing information and, and merging a bit, but no location and, and nothing else is happening. What can the MSC bring? Well, first of all, you have um, APs from different controllers that can maybe report the same interfering device. The MSC will be able to uh, merge that because it gets all information from all controllers, obviously, but it also has the map. And this is very, very uh, important because the MSC can know from a map perspective, is it possible that those two access points here are the same uh, interference? Is the interference this bad that the APs hear, hear it as well? And then it, it can decide, okay, I had two, those two reports from different controllers. They are actually the same microwave oven or the same whatever device it is. So. A tracked interferer on the map is equal to a, to a client for, for the licensing purpose. So if you decide to track interferer, it's just like, like clients. 
one detail. Uh, I said that the controller uses the RF neighbor messages uh, to know if APs are close to each other. Well, this only happens with local mode access points. So access points serving clients because they're active, they send neighbor messages, and, and the controller can know if they are close to each other. If you have monitor mode APs that are just totally passive and just listening on all channels, they don't send messages. So the controller cannot know if they're close to each other. So the controller will not be able to merge the information at all. And that's where the MSC uh, comes in handy because the MSC still has the map and it knows where are the monitor mode APs on the map. So it knows if it's likely that those two monitor APs are, are hearing the same, uh, the same device or not. We have a configurable value of 150 feet. So um, I think uh, that's just a kind of, I don't remember how to convert to meters uh, again, um, but this is configurable. We just uh, noticed that this is the best uh, average values if the APs are further away than that, um, it's very likely that they don't hear the same interferer. If they're closer than that, it's a good chance that it's the same interferer. So it's, again, a value you can tune if you have very specific deployments, like people deploy uh, wireless in, in metro tunnels or environments that actually we, we never thought about. So you can configure this value in case you have a very, very specific environment. Um, Another point about the monitor mode access point and local mode, because the local mode access point is serving clients, the cleaner chipset can only scan the same channel on which the access point is located. So if the AP is on channel six, cleaner will be scanning only the channel six for interference. Um, this is because they use the same antennas and they're just plugged on the same radio, so they have to, to act together. This also allows the cleaner chipset to know when there is Wi-Fi being transmitted, so Wi-Fi is not detected as an interference. Monitor mode access points, because they're totally passive, they can afford to go on all channels and, and scan everything. So the cleaner chipset is really scanning everything there. Uh, the problem is that in 5 gigahertz, because you have a lot of channels and your APs are using all the channels, you might not see all interferences because cleaner chipsets are only scanning the, the channels that are served by the wireless. So that's where you want to add some monitor mode APs on top. Uh, problem we saw with the monitor mode APs is that you really need the map to, to correlate if, if the devices are, interfering devices are the same or not. So the best, if you want a maximum detection and really detect any interference, is to go for um, a mixed mode, so monitor mode APs and, and local mode APs. If you mix a bit and, and have uh, both in your network, you're really covered and, and you really have the best, uh, the best performance in, in, in everything. You can already actually live with only local mode APs. And one actually very nice comment that I heard once is that if your APs are not detecting interference, that means that they are sitting on a channel when there is no interference. And that means why would you care if there is interference in other places? You're just good, right? Your Wi-Fi network is working fine. Actually, that's, that's true, right? So you don't really care if there is interfering devices on channels you're not using. So whatever the APs are detecting, it's what is really, uh, really there in, in, in the environment. How to enable the, the clean air? Actually, it's very easy. On the, on the controller, you have a, a clean air tab, and you just say, Enable clean air, and by default, all devices are, are reported. But you can say, hey, uh, I know about my uh, decked phones. I don't want decked phones to be reported. I know they're there. I just don't want to hear about them. So you can select w which devices you, you care about. From the configuration, this is the output that will tell you if, if you have clean air enabled or not. Clean air capable, yes. And this is, again, the output in, uh, in, in the situation. So as a summary, um, it's nice to know what do you need for clean air? You need 3,500 access points. That's really like the base, mandatory. Then the last control software version 7.0. And from there, you will be able to detect interferers. You will be able to have uh, information about the air quality and so on. And you will actually have every, all the functional, I would say, aspects. Uh, if you have WCS with a plus license and the MSC, 
you will be able to locate and have historical data. I think that's, that's the part to remember. On WCS, you have the same uh, checkbox, enable clean air, if, if you, you configure controller templates. How to verify that cleaner is enabled? Actually, it's, it's quite self-explaining. You have in the in the home page you have a clean air tab, and it will show you the air quality. So if you see small uh, you know small glitches in the air quality, that means that yes, some interference are being detected, so you're you're good to go. On the MSC, don't forget to enable uh, the, the tracking of interferers because it, it's not on by default. Same thing for the historical parameters of the of the MSC. And here we go with the second polling question, uh, just before we, we, we show a bit of a lab example. So do you think Cisco is heading the right way with the technology? Spot on, this is a strong motivator to choose Cisco equipment. B, it still doesn't help administrators enough. C, it requires too much work or understanding. D, I still don't understand what it does. E, no, it seems they don't even listen to customer needs. So you still have 30 seconds to reply to that question uh, in the polling tab of the, of the WebEx meeting. And the polling is closed, so we'll move on. How to troubleshoot common issues? Actually, there is not much to troubleshoot yourself. Uh, you have the usual debugs that are quite intuitive on AP and controller. You can show the same information that is on, on the web GUI, show, show clean air interference status, the debugs. If you think that some events are not being reported, uh, you might want to check it, but it's, it's quite unlikely. Uh, you have here the access point output. So usually you will notice that access points are detecting the stuff quite fine. If there is an issue, it might be more in the merging of the devices on, on the controller and MSC. So that's maybe where you want to look at things. On the WCS, you have here is uh, in, in the usual logs. Here is how an example looks like. This is not really useful to remember by heart, but uh, you will have the slides available afterwards, so you will be able to, to take a look back if, if you need it someday. The MSC uh, logs, uh, same thing. Uh, it's nice to know how the line, uh, the log lines look like, so you, you can actually search for them. You have all the, the merging uh, information there. And here we go with the lab exercise. Uh, I have to apologize because uh, actually the lab setup was working 30 minutes ago, but there is a, a huge heat wave in Belgium and the air conditioning broke down in the lab. So my WCS appliance is actually totally dead. So I only have the controller to, to show you today. Um, I will try to compensate by actually recording on a video the, the demonstration I was planning to do with WCS, and I will post it on the on the Ask the Expert event uh, tomorrow or, or the day after when the when the lab is, is back up. But uh, I had a notice from the lab team that they were doing maintenance. Still, the WCS was working fine, and, and now it's just not. So I'll go share my desktop so we can at least look at the controller. Um, okay, so I think I'm sharing my desktop. Uh, so you see the controller. Usual, usual stuff. You have the new uh, monitor Cisco Clean Air, and you can see interfering devices uh, 11A and 11BGN. So I asked uh, Bastian, who's in the next room, close to the setup, to 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 fire up his uh, his Bluetooth headset. So he's listening to music uh, apparently already now. So you can see that this is being detected. Affected channels, well. We have 180 on channel 1, 180 on channel 11, and 180 on channel 6. So each of them is, is saying that their channel is affected. Uh, why do you have that many reports? Well, actually, you have each AP reporting the information. So you can see that the, each report with a different severity. And we can guess that this AP is most likely the closest one uh, to it because it has the, the most severe RSSI and, and duty cycle. How do you know if it's the same device? 
actually, this is the pseudo MAC I was talking about. So the a MAC address is not a MAC address, but it, I mean, it just looks like a MAC address was assigned to the device, to the interference. And you can see it's the same on all six. So uh, it's just one device. And if you manage to have WCS working, which is not the case for me today, uh, you will see, if you go for monitor interference, you will see only one showing up there, and it, you will have Bluetooth link. And um, if you go on the map, you will also only have one uh, available. Actually, if, if I turn on my phone and I do uh, a scanning to scan for equipment, it should be discovered separately. Let me try that, add equipment. Um, try to connect. And you can see it two seconds after, we already have Bluetooth discovery on all channels. This is my phone. And you can see it's a different MAC address. So it's Bluetooth, it looks the same, but it's, it's not exactly the same. So it's a different MAC address because that is my phone and that is not uh, Bastian's uh, Bluetooth device. Compared to before, this is the nice information that, that we have now, the duty cycle. Uh, because you have the signal strength you're receiving, but you also have the percentage of the of the spectrum that is kept busy by by this transmission, and it can vary a lot between interferers. So that's both those information, RSSI and duty cycle, uh, become the severity, and the severity becomes uh, used in the air quality. So we can see that uh, all APs are returning an average air quality of 98, 99. That's because they're doing a 15 minutes uh, average, and we just turned on the interference uh, recently, but you can also have a graph. It will not tell much because we're at 99, but you will see that over time it's, it's, it's going to degrade if we leave the Bluetooth on. So a Bluetooth that will be turned on for two minutes will not be considered severe, but the Bluetooth that is turned on for two hours will be definitely considered severe. You can also keep track of the worst air quality uh, report you had over time. So it allows you to see how bad it, it really went. Uh, just trying desperately to see if my WCS is really not working today, but no, still not. So uh, unless I'm mistaken, now we're back to the slides. Uh, this slide is just a few links to get you started if, if you really need to, to see this written and you, see, you need to see a white paper about clean air. Those are the basic uh, resources you, you can go. You have the support forum and you have the support pages. Uh, if you have just one question, don't hesitate to, answer, to, to ask the question in the forum. I'm, I'm active there so I can answer, but there's a lot of other people knowledgeable, knowledgeable about clean air there, so they can help as well. And last but not least, the, the last uh, polling question. So polling question number three, are you planning to go for clean air access points in the short future? Answer A, absolutely yes. B, I'm already having plenty, I'm convinced. C, in some situation it can make sense, yeah. D, no, I don't quite see the point. E, it's still too expensive for what it is. I see that lots of people uh, asked questions already, so I'll, I'll, I'll really answer that uh, in, in a second. And the polling is over. So I guess we're going for the questions and answers now. Okay, thank you, Nicola. Great presentation. I want to thank everyone for participating in the event polling. Uh, now it's time to answer some of the questions our viewers have submitted today. And by the way, if you can't stay with us for the Q&A, please be sure to click on the evaluation link provided in the chat to let us know how this session met your business needs and expectations. Uh, the first five listeners to complete this evaluation survey will receive a $20 gift certificate. So now let's go ahead and start the Q&A. We have from one listener today, um, APs are dual band. Is the SAGE running in both Yes. 2.5 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz at the same time? Yes, they are. Okay. And the next question, uh, does all your APs have to be 3,500? No. Uh, you will have cleaner information on the 3,500 APs. The other will just work fine the same way they were working before. Okay. 
And it says WLC on the slide. I've heard that Cisco Prime NCS is the great new thing. How is that different? Uh, sorry, can you come again? Sure. It says WLC on the slide. And yep. I've heard that Cisco Prime NCS is the great new thing. How is that different? Uh, the NCS, if, if, I'm, if I'm understanding the acronym correctly, is actually the new WCS version. So, uh, and there, there is no WCS 8.0 that will come out. It will be called NCS because now it will manage uh, both wired and, and wireless networks at the same time. So all the clean air features will still be in that one. Uh, the good thing is that it will be integrated with uh, wired networks. So you will have probably more features, uh, but just, just consider it like WCS. So you need the controller, the WLC to, to handle the access point. You need the controller to receive the access point reports and everything. And WCS or NCS is just there as an extra feature to work with the, with the MSC and have location and historical data. Okay. And are there issues with mixing the clean air, AP, and non-clean air? Uh, not really, no. Uh, the thing is that they will have the, the, their RRM, the, their radio resource uh, algorithm, working on different triggers. So the clean air AP will be able to use the real severity of real interference, while the other will just shoot their, their best guesses. So you might have some performance difference in, in the selecting of, of channels, but really no issues is, is expected and no issues was discovered so far. So. Okay. And is the monitor mode still needed? How, it, how does it differentiate from ELM enhanced local mode? Um, that's a good question. Uh, I don't remember the enhanced local mode, um, what it was doing. There, there was a uh, local mode. I will come back on, on that question later because I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I can answer it properly. Okay, we'll address that at a later time. What functionality does MSC add to clean air? Um, the location, <clears throat> so you have the interference being marked on the map, and historical data is kept. So with the controllers, you only have uh, 15 minutes of, of information, and the MSC allows to keep for weeks and weeks of, of information. Okay, and do all APs need <clears throat> to have clean air? And do I need to replace everything I already have? Uh, you don't need to replace, no. So you can decide. Um, <clears throat> for budget restriction, for example, it could make sense that you say, uh, I, I will put uh, 1260 APs, for example. So, so it, it's the clean air uh, with, it's the same as the clean air AP without the clean air chipset. Uh, so it has the same 11 and capabilities. You might say, I will go for 1260s, but on each floor, I will put one clean air access point so that at least I have a good, uh, a good idea about interference on that floor. So that is possible as well and not a problem. <clears throat> and are there any price incentives to upgrading our current APs? Uh, yeah, I, I saw there were other questions like that, like uh, can you mention the price before we say if it's too, too expensive or not? That depends on, on countries and if you're a gold partner and lots of stuff I actually have no idea about, so I actually don't know the prices at all. So I'm the bad person for that. Okay. Uh, will we be able to provide that for them on the Ask the Experts follow-up? Uh, well, there is the ordering tool on, on Cisco.com. Okay. Um, but it's, it's an average. And usually if, if you contact your reseller, your local reseller, you will have reductions uh, that are just not mentioned on, on the online tool. So. It's just probably a best guess. So you will be able to see the difference between clean air and, and I would say in standard uh, hardware, but the price will exact, not exactly be the same as, as in your country. All right, thank you. And can you view the PMAC from the WLC CLI? Yes, so on the command line, we have the exact same information as on the GUI. So if you go for show uh, clean air interferers, you will have the, the pseudo Mac mentioned in, in, the, in the table there. So you can know if it's the same interferer or not. And is WCS needed for clean air to function? 
Uh, no, clean air can function. So the minimum you need for clean air is a controller with 7.0 and at least one clean air access point. Uh, from there, you can have the interfering information of that access point uh, over a period of 15 minutes. Okay. And is it only 3500 supports clean air technology? What about other APs like uh, 1252AG and 1400s? Uh, no, the clean air will stay 30, 30 something. So I, I heard that Cisco will come up with uh, even new clean air uh, APs, that, but they will be 3,500 or 3,600. Uh, in parallel, you will still have the, the other, like 1,250, 1,260, and those are the same as the clean air APs, but without clean air technology. So if you're still not convinced and you don't need to know about interference, you will be able to still buy new access points that are uh, – on the edge of technology, but without the clean air uh, feature. So probably a bit cheaper. Uh, regarding clean air technology, when is it introduced by Cisco? It was introduced uh, one year and a half ago, actually, already. So uh, I might be a few months uh, mistaken, but it, it was introduced yeah, uh, about more than a year ago. So actually when the 7.0 uh, software came out. And does only Cisco have this kind of technology, or are there any other vendors working on this kind of technology, say Motorola? This is an interesting question. Uh, the answer is no, this is unique. So if you hear other competitors talking about we detect interference, actually what they mean is that they are doing the same as Cisco was doing until clean air. They go with best guesses and, and guessing algorithm. If you don't have a, a resolution that is 150 kilohertz, you, you cannot be as precise. Uh, they just cannot detect. The good question uh, to ask them is, can you differentiate uh, a microwave oven from a Bluetooth device, a Bluetooth device that is discovering, so we, we saw that my phone scanning was uh, different from a file transfer on the phone or, or something like this. So, and the, the vendors will most likely answer, no, we cannot. Um, Cisco is the only one to have this Sage chipset, which actually does miracles. And uh, so far, no one has come up with anything coming close. What is the advantage of the PLUS license? Uh, it's required if you go for WCS and, and the MSC to use the, the clean air with it. Normally, the PLUS license, uh, we say it's to have uh, the location information. So if you want to have WCS just for management and you don't care about location, you, you can have a WCS base. But uh, Clean Air now is also on the plus license of WCS. So you cannot have a WCS base license and, and use it for Clean Air uh, purpose. You will still be able to manage access points, but no Clean Air information there. And are there plans to do Clean Air with Mesh? <clears throat> yes. I heard about that. Uh, I cannot give plans, but uh, I know that, yes, it's coming, definitely. And can you summarize briefly... Um, some of the clean air technology? Sure, so I'll, I'll try to come up with a like four or five sentence summary. So what is clean air? It's a hardware chipset present on some model of the access points, like 3500s, and it allows to precisely identify what is the interference source and uh, to merge information from all access points about this. So it allows you to know what are the interference in your network, how many access points there are, um, interfering and how bad they're interfering your access points. And thanks to that information, the access points can take much smarter decisions when they change channel and they, they take RRM decisions. I hope it summarizes it. <laughs> <laughs> and what is the maximum and minimum distance that is configurable <clears throat> for AP distance? Uh, that's actually a very good question. I don't think there's a... a maximum on the upper size. Uh, there is a minimum though. Um, I honestly don't remember how much it is. So I, I can actually come up with a precise number uh, also in the Ask the Expert event because I, I don't have the number handy. And I've read different information regarding the number of clients per 3500 AP. Can you <coughs> tell me what the recommended number of data clients and also the recommended number of voice clients? Um, yeah, actually, it's very interesting to note 
As I mentioned, the difference between a 1140 or, or a 1260 and 3500 is just the Clean Air chipset. So if you ask me how many clients does the Clean Air Access Point support compared to a normal access point, I will say exactly the same. That, that's the answer, because detecting interference doesn't mean you will support more clients. Uh, so I think recommended numbers are around 20 per access point, per, per radio. Uh, you can read 15 or 25. The thing is that it's, it's, it's just varying. It depends what you want to do. If people are just, you know, seldomly using their laptop and just sometimes browsing a web page, you can probably put 30 and it, it will work fine. But if people are using emails and really going, uh, using it hard, 30, they will notice that the network is very slow. You're still sharing a medium and, and being 30 on an access point radio, whatever the speed, it's like being on a hub and being 30 person on the same hub. It's being 30 person on the same cable. Whatever is the speed you have there, you will have collisions, you will have problems. So a number of clients is, is not increasing a lot. And with 5 gigahertz, is the Sage chip able to scan all 40 megahertz if bonded? Yes. Um, it actually scans the same, uh, how can I say, the same channel as the AP is serving. So if you set the AP for 40 megahertz, the Sage chipset will scan 40 megahertz. And this special chip for clean air, does it give burden to CPU of access point, or does it impact the, the CPU performance of AP? Totally independent. So uh, it, it, it doesn't bring any, any load. Uh, the only load required on the access point is to send uh, every few seconds a packet with uh, detected interferers. So that, that, that's really nothing. Uh, the, all the calculation and scanning and computations are done by the Sage chipset, so really uh, no, no overhead on that side. And one important thing to note is that it still works on normal uh, power over Ethernet. So it doesn't consume much more power uh, than a normal access point, and you can still run it on normal PoE power injectors and switches. So that is also a very good point to note. And are there any comparisons of how the performance improves with this technology, like diagrams, et cetera? Uh, no, because that means you need to know the interferers you have. So. I mean, you can come up with any example. I can work on a lab, and the lab will show you that without clean air, the quality is really, really bad, and with clean air, everything is saved because I will put a lot of microwave ovens and I will put a lot of, of interferers. Right, uh, but you cannot really have a, a, I mean, a precise number. It just depends on your environment, so it's really hard to have a graph like that. And what is so specific about clean air? Oh, wasn't rogue detection achieving this before? Uh, no. <clears throat> rogue detection, it's only on Wi-Fi signal. So what you're detecting is rogue access points and only Wi-Fi access points. If somebody is on, on an overlapping channel, so not really the same channel as you, this is seen as noise. You, you can't even decode it, so it's not a rogue access point. Um, so that's just not the same feature. And uh, before it was done by the Wi-Fi chipset. So you also have the, the resolution. The Wi-Fi chipset just sees, oh, this is noise. It's definitely not good enough to identify what kind of noise it is, if it's Bluetooth, if it's uh, microwave oven or, or whatever. And can I use the APs with Spectrum Expert? Yes, that's a very, very good question. Um, actually, why is there no uh, new Spectrum Expert release? People said, hey, I want a Spectrum Expert card, uh, and I want to use it with Windows 7, and I don't have the drivers, and et cetera, et cetera. Well, now you don't actually need the Cisco Spectrum Expert because you have the clean air access point. Uh, you can just take one access point, and uh, you, you connect your laptop uh, to it, and, and it just does the same job. So how does this work? You, you take your laptop, you run the Cisco Spectrum tool that is downloadable from Cisco site, and uh, you enter the IP address of the clean air access point. And you have the whole spectrum analysis of that access point. So it's just like you had the Spectrum Expert card and you were sitting where the access point is. What does this mean is that 
you can have a huge deployment, like 10 buildings, Wi-Fi everywhere, and you just sit in your administration room and you just put the IP addresses in, in your uh, Spectrum Expert software. And it, it's as if you were walking in the building and, and taking a Spectrum Expert trace of, of anywhere. So that's really, it's as if you had a, a Spectrum Analyzer everywhere in your building, which is really, really nice for, for people uh, using that tool. Okay, and we're gonna take the uh, last two questions here. Other than number of devices, is there a difference between 3310, ADN, 3355 with regards to clean air? Uh, I guess that refers to the models of MSC appliances. Uh, no, there is no difference apart from the uh, computing power and, and the limits of devices tracked. And will the WLC change the channels the APs run on to avoid the detected interference? Yes. So, actually, it's an interesting question. If you go on YouTube and, and look for competitors, you will see them doing tests and, and kind of funny tests. They have uh, a laptop and access point. They're watching a video. And then they turn on some, some noise uh, in interfering device. And they will say, hey, our access point is changing channel 10 seconds before Cisco AP is doing. Wow, that, that's great. But what you're bringing is something that's jamming the whole, the whole channel. So it, I mean, that kind of never happens. What if you, you're having one Bluetooth phone or, or 10 Bluetooth phones? Is your access point smart enough to say, okay, one Bluetooth phone is, is not serious, I can live with it, but 10 Bluetooth phone is just better if I move channel? No, their access point is not smart enough for that. So that is where our access points uh, really have uh, handy features that they're smart enough to decide if it's worth to change channel. Because don't forget that changing channel means you disconnect all your clients. And that is something you don't want to do all the time. So. Okay, well, this will conclude the Q&A portion of today's event. Uh, Nicola will be hosting an Ask the Expert event starting now, June 28th until July 8th. If you have additional questions, please log in to Cisco Support Community and click on the Ask the Experts tab at the top. Nicola will continue answering your questions through the community site over the next two weeks. If you have not explored the Cisco Support Community, uh, please take a moment to check out this excellent resource at HTTPS supportforums.cisco.com. We invite you to attend our next CSC Expert Series webcast with Triple CCIE Customer Support Engineer Randy Wu from Sydney, Australia. The topic will be on configuring Cisco Unified Border Element for the Public Switch Telephone Network Session Initiation Protocol Trunks. And that's going to be on Wednesday, July 27th at 8 a.m. Sydney, Australia, and Tuesday, July 26th, 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time uh, on the West Coast of the U.S. You can register for this live webcast at www.ciscolive.com forward slash ATE. We also want to let you know that the iPad app for the Cisco support community will be available as of July 1st. The app will be available in English for download in all countries within the iTunes stores. We also have an iPhone app currently available for download from the iTunes store as well. So stay tuned and visit the iTunes store. And if you need more information on that, please visit supportforums.cisco.com. Uh, before signing off today, please take a few minutes to complete your evaluation of today's session, and this will help us address your business needs and interest in the future. I'd like to thank our expert, Nicola, for sharing his expertise with us today. I'd like to thank all attendees and I wish that you have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, Francine. So that concludes the session for today. Just a reminder that a survey will appear when you close your browser. We greatly appreciate your feedback. Thank you for joining us, and have a great day.